Okay, for those of you who are new, um, there's a list of the areas, the geographic areas that we cover, where geographically it's probably one of the biggest floods in California, I think. Um, but we cover all of the, the territory that's listed here. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Who's a veteran? Ah, Randy, will you please lead us in the play? Okay. Thank you for your service. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I see some new faces out there. Um, there are empty chairs over here. We got them in the right here. Yeah, and I know they jammed them in. So I'm sorry they're jammed in, but that's the consequence of having round tables, which everybody seems to really like. So, okay. Um, if you're new and have never been to a pandemic speaking, raise your hand. Let's see how many new people we have. Oh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> and we have new members signing up, so that's really all good stuff. Um, please introduce yourself to the people at the table, and um, next time you can go to a different table and you'll meet more new people, okay? All right. Linda and Richard. How are you doing, Randy? Uh, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep with our schedule, Barbara. Yeah. Uh, so just, I know so we all were so excited so to hear what the president, careful. the past president right. said. At the town hall, how many of you watched the town hall? I did. Okay, these are the maps. Look yeah. around. Yeah. They're the maps. And I'm not watching uh, CNN anymore. But the Economist says that Donald Trump has become more dangerous. As awful as it was, the the CNN town hall did the country a service by revealing the threat he presents. Yeah. Like yeah. we didn't remember that. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. I, I love the economist cartoons. I have to share. Okay, so this is our agenda, and you have one hopefully at your place, and also a little notice about the uh, library book sale that's coming up. Uh, please pay attention to that. It will make my sister very happy because she runs most for the library. Um, on your agenda, you'll see items that are checked, like the agenda, the forum, the minutes of prior meeting, the motion to adjourn, and the treasurer's report. And we would like to handle all of those in one fell swoop with one vote and then go on with the meeting. Um, so I'm going to show you the treasurer's report right now. Ken, raise your hand for those who don't know Ken. Uh, this operation would close down immediately if we didn't have Ken. Because Ken, Ken manages to do both an FTPC report for California and an FEC for the federal government. And he's been doing it how many years, Ken? Seven. Seven. Wow. He deserves a congressional medal. <laughs> what a nasty job. Anyway, um, so you can see the good news is that our income is going up. And that's what we wanted to do this year so that we have the money next year to get to candidates. So any questions on the treasurer's report? Good. Okay. So we are going to vote now on the um, items on the consent list. Uh, so I need a motion to adopt the consent list. Okay. Second. Second. Second from her. Okay. Um, if you're a member of Ken Demand, a make a member in good standing, that means you paid your dues, and you're a Democrat, uh, you can vote. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Uh, opposed. See, we're done with that. Okay. We have a request from the communications team from Cindy. If you're attending the uh, Kadam convention that's coming up. We encourage you to post pictures on Facebook or send them to Cindy 
at Cindy Ashley, Cindy.Ashley at Cox.net. Um, and please follow her directions if you're going to do it in this little thing at the bottom. And I'm sure all of you who do this know what that means. I have not a clue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Janet. There you go, Ready to Okay, so I'm sure it's uh yeah, I, I'll just have it right here. Okay. Kind of follow along backwards. Um well thank you all for coming. And uh now that we mentioned the, the money in our accounts, that now we move to this part of the segment because this is where we spend the bulk of our money on our candidates. Uh, so all of the your membership, when you buy things there, when you go to certain events, all of that is for um the candidates. So we'll, we'll start with the 40th congressional district. Oh, with the reminder that we did redistricting. You know, I, I that things are uh, different now. So the 40th district includes Orange County, some of Orange County, some of San Bernardino County, and some of Ruth, Riverside County. We well, ended up with these odd um, <coughs> areas here. And for us, that's part of Lake Forest, part of RSM, you know, those kind of parts more out in the eastern part. And right now, it's Young Kim uh, who is in that. Uh, I know. So during the last election, the numbers were just, I mean, they didn't even have a damn who ran. That's how bad it was for the Republicans. So every year is New Year. You get new people that move in. You get new people who now all of a sudden can vote, you know, because of their age. So it does change. So we'll have to keep a look on that and see what the, um, the makeup is of the 40th. Then we go on to the Assembly uh, 71st, and that is Kate Sanchez and some of you probably have her, that would be uh, mostly San Diego County, which kind of gives us a short trip, right? Because we have a, uh, a representative who is mostly down in the San Diego area. Um, now, just to give you a little, I did do have a little bit of information on her area. Um, at that time, there were 40% Republicans, 30% Dems, and this is always the interesting part, 23% NPPs. So we're we're not drawing enough of those NPPs, you know, and admittedly they are no party preference. <laughs> Typically they're Dems, but over the past few years, probably some of the people have left the Republican Party too, right? And are mixed in. So it, it might be a new story for us. <laughs> and then we go to the uh, uh, Assembly 72, which is basically the coastal part of Orange County and a little bit for us of Lake Forest. And that's Diane Dixon, who is currently in that position. I know once I say the name, then you, you guys remember because you're, you're getting, uh, I don't know about you, but I noticed that this time around, the candidates are communicating more with the constituents. Now they might not be having town halls, but they're sending us emails and, and things like that. Now for the Orange County Board of Supervisors, which is an area that we have been gaining ground on in terms of Dems on the board, uh, right now it's Don Wagner, who we would like to in the area number three. So we'd like to see what we can do there. And then we're moving, uh, there's one uh, community college district, number seven, that is uh, going to be available. And lots of water districts. We've yet to get a candidate, even one candidate who is interested in the water. Yet yeah, water is such a big deal around here. And we don't have, we've never had a candidate other than Nyla Clement, who we supported, but you know, there was a gentleman that I searched him. Did we for water board? Yeah. Okay, but was that an incumbent? No, no. Oh, okay, okay, thank you for me. Yeah. Okay, all right, and okay. But typically we have a hard time Finding anybody who is really interested, but thank you for correcting me because we, we have to be correct in our information. Okay, now for uh, school districts, Saddleback is going to have two positions open. Neither candidate has expressed whether they are going to run or not. Uh, one is Ed Wong, who is a member of our club, and the other one is Amanda Morrell, and uh, she's out more in the Portola area, and Ed Wong is over in the Laguna Hills area. So we'll see what develops there. Uh, and then for 
school board, which uh, is going to be another slide for Orange County School Board, it's desperate times. It, no, it really, really is because it is a very interesting group of people that are on that board that are controlling the charter schools and are controlling. And the, the way they're doing it is they are so heavily financed. So they're approving all of the charter schools that come their way. They are siphoning off from our public schools. They're um, they're not supporting our public schools. They're not supporting, you know, just middle of the road education. They're, I mean, they really are way, way over there. Why are they doing this? For money. Yeah, yeah, because charter schools are getting yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Money. And, and I think there's always a little bit of power involved in this thing. But yeah. Sorry? Yep, yeah, but the people on the boards are part of the Charter Schools Association. Oh. Like Mary Arkey, uh, now I don't know if she's going to get the board, so I don't know where that all is and everything. But her husband was on those boards. So it, it's very, very incestuous. So it isn't just like, uh, I'm a board, I'm giving you money. They're involved in those boards. So this is a, a key oh, one. And there's Nancy Watkins, who is a dam, who is running. <coughs> And we'll put up the call, right? Yeah, there she goes. Uh, and so right now we have Ken Williams, who's way, um, way over, you know, on the other side. And thankfully, in our community, we do have a woman who is a retired uh, federal judge, Lynn Riddle, who really is the watchdog for, you know, and, and keeps anybody who shows up at a meeting, she gets your email, she will keep you informed every little thing that goes on. So thank God there is somebody out there who is watching them. What we can do, nothing until we get somebody elected. And we have to slowly, you know, start doing that. So um, we'll, we'll give you more information on Nancy as time comes and um, all of these candidates, whoever uh, ends up, you know, the Dem candidates, we have a process where we go through and we interview them and then uh, committee interviews and the executive board interviews, and we bring them to you. Um, so it's all part of a, a process. We just don't say, oh, here's our candidate. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, where is uh, District 3? It's on the map. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's basically north of us. The only part of our club that covers District 3 are uh, Santiago, Majesca, and uh, uh, no, it's, not, no. it's all the all the candidates. And will she be elected by district or at large? Uh, by district. Yeah, these are district here. No, there is no. Right. What? Right. No, I, I checked on this. I actually had an argument with uh, my friend, former student Nancy Watkins, who told me that it wasn't, and I said, "You go check with the registrar of voters." So that's that's where we are right now, and we're you know starting to um, call candidates and see who will uh, come on out. And then of course we have our city uh, folks that will start working on giving you more information as we go on there. Yeah. Oh, Ken, there he is. Oh, good. Well, okay. So Ken is uh, he ran last time for RSM, and at that moment he committed and said that he would run again. So, yeah. He's been a, doing a good job of getting his name out there. He kept his website alive. He he keeps constantly active in it. That's what you got to do. And he's a real expert on writing candidates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. It's a little complicated. So yeah. between Janet and I, we really try to keep it straight. Um, Barbara, you want to say a few words about the Mission Hill Street Fair? There's your slide, girl. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but for many years, the club has gone to the Mission Viejo Street Fair, um, July 4th. And um, we didn't, we stopped during COVID, um, but we're going to go back this year. So, um, it's a really great opportunity for the club because they say 20,000 people uh, attend this event. 
and we're gonna reg try and register Democrats and um, just let them let people know about the good stuff that we're doing. This year, they're gonna let us sell uh, merchandise, so we might make some money on it as well. Um, and uh, but we need volunteers to sign up for it. Um, we've got shifts, two hour shifts, so you don't have to work too long. Um, starting at nine, nine, of 11, one, three, five, and seven. Now the nine o'clock shift is a setup shift. So it's not really uh, interacting with the community. Um, so we're kind of looking for somebody that's willing to lift chair. I mean, it's they're not that heavy. Women have done it. Anne Owens has done it. <laughs> She's done it all. <laughs> but it'd be nice to have some strong men to, uh, to do that. And set down is the same. Set um, take down is the same too. So um, this is posted on the website, so you can go sign up. Um, and if you don't want to sign up to work, but you're going to the event, stop by the table. We're going to have it be a fun event. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, see me afterwards, or uh, if you don't want to sign up at the website, let me know, and I will, I'll put you in. We'll probably have to juggle the schedule around. Uh, you don't really have to have any experience. Uh, we're going to have experienced people hooked up with um, inexperienced people so people can learn the ropes. So. Yeah, maybe shift, you can stay and watch the fireworks, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. You stay and watch the fireworks. Yeah, you might want to think about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. And if you just go to the website, it's just on the scroll at the beginning of the website. Okay. Um, if you look on the back of your agenda, there is a information that looks exactly like this slide. We have our focus group, and Andy Alexander is in charge of those, so I'll let her tell you more. <laughs> Kathy, I know you want to speak. Get ready. Um, um, as Louise said, look at the back of your agenda to see what the focus groups do. And I just wanted to um, say about the town hall, Lake Forest did a town hall for Diane Dixon. And they did, they forgot to look at their own facilities rules that say that no, they will not rent their facilities to anyone for any political events whatsoever of any kind. And I casually reminded that of them at a city council meeting and they have not done any town halls since, but this is what the cities are doing now. They are having a fentanyl workshop or seminar, and they're inviting Don Wagner to be there at that. Or they're doing a uh, chamber of commerce event, and they're inviting some other representative. And there's also speaking on the dais about, now there's nothing wrong with these things, but they're getting the word out there about their candidates. Mm -hmm then they're doing it their way. Um, they casually mentioned on the dais during a meeting or at the end of a meeting when the council members speak about what they've accomplished and done, that uh, they had a meeting with Young Kim and the food commands of that meeting. So they're getting their, they're doing their thing. Um, I wanna give a shout out very quickly to Nina. Nina, where are you? The door. Oh, she's at the door working. She has organized a group called uh, Liberal Ladies of RSM, and they're doing a great job. And they're meeting, I think, about once a month in various locations. Last time was at a park, so the kids and families could come. Um, and I think that's it. Now, Kathy would like to speak with you. First, I have to get her. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Kathy Palmer will speak to you about the Mission Diego focus group. <laughs> make a comment because you just made a really, really important point about being an incumbent. Whether they're Dems or Republicans, the many you're an incumbent, you have offered to certain things that as a candidate you do not. Like you get to go to things like the fentanyl thing, you get to go to whatever they have. So that's what makes it that much more difficult 
for somebody who is not a, an incumbent. So here's an example of something that's happening right here in Mission Viejo. Um, how many of you have been following the core vision plan development? Not enough, not enough of you, because the city of Mission Viejo is proposing to spend hundreds and millions of your dollars on a plan that is at this point, as they say in the computer world, vaporware. So my uh, urge to you is to investigate through the city's website. There is a whole website. They've developed a whole website called Envision Mission Viejo. And it lays out this plan, uh, the plans that they have for this old Steinmark building that is currently being rented to Oakmont Search for 16 months. So they have a search in there paying rent right now. Uh, what will happen at the end of those 16 months? Uh, you will see um, their fantasy if you look online. The Community Services Commission is meeting tonight to talk about the recreation aspects of this plan. Uh, the Planning and Transportation Commission talked about it last Monday. Um, and the next time this will come up for discussion with the community is at next Tuesday's City Council meeting, which starts at 6. So I don't want to tell you what to think about this plan because some of it is probably needed. But I do want you to look at it with a very jaundiced eye and ask questions like, how much is this going to cost? What is the impact going to be on the current tenants of this center surrounding the Steinmark building? What area do these pretty pictures cover? Because one thing that's very unclear is that the city only owns the Steinmark building and the small, uh, the four smaller retail units to the <coughs> north of it, which I think it's the Poke Bowl place, there's a yogurt place. Their plan, that's the only part of this center that they own. But if you look at these consultant designed presentations, you would get the impression that the whole center is going to turn into Universal Studios. So ask questions. You may have ideas that you like that they're presenting. Please be positive, but please pay attention because this money will be taken out of the budget. If you like the library, if you like having the Murray Center, if you like trails that are well maintained and the things that the city already does, you need to be aware of what they are intending to do with your money and to ask questions about where and how will this be financed. So um, you have my uh, email address on this. If you would like, we have a focus group meeting on Thursday, this Thursday. Um, if you would like to attend, email me your contact information and I will send you an invitation. We meet on Zoom, so it's really easy. So if you have any questions, you can talk to me later. Okay, but be involved at the local level. Thank you. And the other thing that you can see on this slide is that the article that I put up comes from Voice of OC. So I would like to, and I know Kathy agrees with you, uh, we would like to, you to encourage you to read Voice of OC. And if you believe in local journalism that's nonpartisan, we would encourage you to um, pay a membership in Voice of OC to support them um, because it doesn't come free. Somebody has to pay for it. Okay, so Anne. I live in Lake Forest, but there's all I I signed up for the Mission Bay newsletter you get, and um, the last one that came, you could actually make a comment about this project on there. So I made a I'm going to make a comment. Um, so it's another way for them to know there's people out there 
uh, interested. Uh, they need to know people are watching them. Okay, on to membership. We have 374. We're getting there. Um, two more today. So uh, hopefully everybody will keep um, coming in. Okay, so if you have signed up, you should have gotten, uh, unless you just signed up in the last week or so, you should have gotten a questionnaire in the mail, which is new this year. We're just trying to um, know a little bit about, more about you as our members and what your background is, what your interests are, what you would like to see the club uh, doing um, with your dues and with your uh, the time that you come and spend with us. So we really would appreciate if you would fill that questionnaire out and return it. We've had about, what, maybe 45 or so uh, returns so far. Yeah. And Heather sends them out kind of in bunches. So if you just say that if you joined the last week or two, she'll probably you know take that bunch of maybe 10 and then send out that questionnaire. You send it back. And there's Randy Simmons that finally um, agreed to collate all the information, which he is then going to send on to all the committee chairs so they know what people have, what talents and interests. And um, Randy also would like to, he has an information sheet that he would like to give to all the committee chairs tonight. So if you could uh, stay for two minutes after the meeting, sign, stand up, Randy. Bye, Randy. Um, so he can give you the information that you need to know about that. Okay. Uh, questions? Great. Okay. Um, we also are coming up to our final time for people to uh, be able to sign up for the, to be a pre endorsement representative. Um, in the fall, we vote for our representatives at the general meeting, and, or excuse me, in June, we're going to be voting. Um, the actual event is not going to take place uh, until the fall. But right now, we have to elect representatives from our club that will represent us at this. Um, uh, committee um, event that's going to be in the fall. And so uh, some of you, I think right now I have something like maybe nine um, forms that you've given me. It's organized by your assembly district. So if you're in 71 or if you're in 72, um, and we get to send a representative for every 20 members we have in that district, Mission Viejo can send uh, 11 people. And we do not have 11 people that ex have expressed an interest. So um, I have some more here if you're interested. I need these really by the end of the week. Uh, I'm going out of town for different things. We're going to do the actual election in June. So we need to have these all back so we can create ballots, et cetera, for uh, you to sign um, and vote in June. Yes. Okay. But what? Which week are they voting on? We don't know at this point. Thank we you. don't know. Okay. It's Congress, Senate, yeah. Yeah, it's state, federal. State party. Right, yeah. It's not city council. Yeah. No, no it's, it's state, federal um, offices. So is there anybody that would like, uh, I know a few people took them on the way in. Is there anybody else that would like to have a application for it? And it, It's kind of fun because you get to work with the other people on the committee to interview can, potential candidates. Um, but then you get to vote in your conscience. We don't, unlike other clubs, we don't tell you who to vote for. So you get to make that decision. All right, so if you like, Lynn, see me after the meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the June donations, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> coming up in June, we're collecting for Second Impressions, which is over here in Lake Forest. And so we're looking for donations of cleaning, very gently used clothing for men, women, purses, jewelry, and shoes. And you will be reminded in the newsletter. So Marty, I'm gonna talk about fundraising. Yes, ma'am. I put up everything you sent me. Thank you very much. Hello, Canyon Downs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, oh. because you touched the side that you saw. That's okay. I mean, just let me let me go back. Okay. 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 All right. So if you don't, I won't touch anything. Here. <laughs> I need my notes. You are one generous group of people, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you have done for us. Um, we are working very hard, and um, for example, for example, we've got our fifty-fifty. 
picket drawing. We don't do that. Um, <laughs> we're not supposed to. So if you haven't had a chance, go right ahead and, and raise your hand, and Melora will come and, and take care of that. And if you're not interested in raffles, and not everybody is, we have a program called Sustaining Donors. And what sustaining donors do is they give a little extra over and above their dues. And you might want to use the $5 that you don't want to spend on a raffle and put it on a sustaining donor program. That way, it's an easy way to give us an extra 60 bucks a year. It's very, very easy. And um, over this, just up until middle of April, um, we're over $5,000 already in that program. It's an amazing thing. So if you're not a raffle person, become a sustaining donor. And here's why. Because at the end of September, we have a thank you event for our sustaining donors. And I can't tell you yet what it's going to be, but it's going to be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have special guests that you will never believe. Anyway, so another reason to become a sustaining donor. $5 will do it. $100 is better if you've got it, but whatever. Um, okay. We have started working with us, what we're calling a small business group. And if you have a small business, we would love to have you join us. Um, yeah, maybe. Oh, well, you know what? Let me let me go in order. I, I digress. I, nobody can get me. Okay, so Friday, July 28th, we are going to have an ice cream social. It's going to be an evening event so that you can join us for dessert. Bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring the next door neighbors, whoever you want. Um, it's twenty dollars for adults, ten dollars for kids. And all the ice cream you can eat. Um, July eighteenth, we are lucky enough that our wonderful program committee has gotten Russ Feingold, the former Wisconsin senator, to come and talk to us in person. And so, not to let an opportunity go by, we're going to host the VIP reception before the meeting so that you can actually get up close and personal with the Wisconsin former senator. So. We're gonna do that. Um, it'll be from five to six thirty right here on the patio. So you won't have to. There'll be food, so the other will feed you. Um, and that's going to be fifty dollars because it's special and it's a fundraiser. Um, at our August meeting, we had a survey that we that the club did, and some people expressed an interest in because we are um, we meet so early. A lot of people don't have a chance to eat dinner before they get here. So we're gonna offer um, pizza and a soft drink. So we will get we will send information out about that. But in the August meeting, maybe you want to join us a little early and have some pizza with us. Um, and then, like I said, September 30th, it's kind of focused. Um, October 17th at our general meeting, um, our, our ticket thingy will be to win a ticket or two to our amazing Halloween party, which is held at the home of the Kleckners, and they decorate like Halloween grew up in their house. It's amazing. <laughs> they are amazing decorators. <laughs> that was what Cal called. Um, and October 28th is the Halloween party. And then, of course, on December 9th, we're going to have our um, annual Richard O'Neill brunch. That's our big, big dollar, big ticket item for the year. And um, it's not too early to start thinking about things that you might have to donate. Uh, we have a wine wall every year, so if you've got a bottle of wine laying around that you're not going to drink um, and it's worth $20 or more, we'd love to take it off your hands and we'll put it up on our wine wall. Um, and uh, if you have gift cards, somebody gave you a gift card to a store you're never going to go to, we'll take it. Um, we'll put it in a basket and wrap a lot of sucker off. So um, if you've got that kind of stuff, or you know, be creative. You know, we're we're willing to put almost anything into a basket. We'll find a way to make it work. Our, our Melora is one of our wonderful basket makers. She makes all the ones for, for um, the meetings and we get together and we have a good time putting together crazy stuff. So um, that's terrific. Now, how do I make it work? I don't want to touch anything I'm not supposed to. There we go, okay. Right at the and recount it. So can you give me until the very last minute? Or can we sure. Okay, go spell it. Yeah. Okay, over to the yeah. We can we can do that. You tell me when you're ready. Yeah, we want to make sure that we're able to give you back as much. We never turn down. Okay, so 
talking about the O'Neill brunch, we are selling advertising in the program. That was part of our small business meeting. Um, luckily, we've already sold the back cover of the of the book, so we can't have that. But there are many full page ads and other opportunities if you'd like to do that. So um, we've got early bird pricing until October 1st. So again, if you have a business or if you know somebody who has a small business and they're good Democrats and you'd like to have them uh, be able to advertise, our plan is that we know that we have small business owners in our, in our, in our club. We want to be able to spotlight those people because if I need a plumber, I would much rather hire somebody from Canyon Downs than somebody off of the internet. So um, we're going to try and make it easy for you to find people who are in our club for the stuff that you need. So we're going to have a, um, a page where all of them will be listed. Um, later on in the year, we're going to do a small business night where they'll all be able to come and have their literature and stuff just so you can meet them. And, um, and then we're asking them to help offset the cost of the brunch by buying that. You also could do that if you've got something to celebrate. Last year, a couple of our committee chairs brought little um, business side, business card side ads um, to thank their committees for another year of hard work. So that's another opportunity for those of you who are committee chairs. Um, do I have another slide? Or is that I don't think done? so. <laughs> I think I'm done. I think you're done. I think I'm done. Okay. Oh, one quick thing. Um, we had um, we had our sales like we had this time at our April meeting. <laughs> oh, I think I okay. Ah, see there. Um, we also did a pop up on two Fridays ago, and then another one last Saturday, and then from what we earned from our fifty fifty, six hundred and ninety one dollars. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for the thirty dollars. We so, so appreciate it. Thank you so much. Five, five. And I want to report that the tomato plant that I bought there is doing fine. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, Laura, we're gonna, about to move into speakers. So how are you doing? Well, you, you, you want me to stop having people give me money? Yes. Well, but that that also means that if you're gonna leave early, so her, you want to come up? Who's introducing our guests? So this is the list of the upcoming people. Do you want to say anything about them, her? You don't have to. Okay. Um, you know, you saw it. You read it. I have you more than. I couldn't. I couldn't resist this picture. Yeah. Just think about what's in that picture. Actually, that's an interesting lead-in uh, to the, today's presentation. We have a first page of the lead-in of his presentation. Yeah. Well, he appreciates. As soon as you introduce them, then we'll put it out. Okay. So it's a, it's a lead in. I want to just discuss very briefly my own personal experience on immigration. And it goes back to my grandparents. And probably in your case, it may go back to your grandparents and great grandparents. But it's a generation ago, it's 100 years ago. Not, it's not what the speaker is going to talk about. And when the speaker mentioned that he has a BA from Columbia, I recalled what we visited, what is called the Tenement Museum in lower uh, Manhattan, on the east side of Manhattan. How many of you have been to the Tenement Museum? It's a place that, of those who haven't been there with three generations, at least three generations of immigrants uh, live, actually live. Irish immigrants in the 1800s, early 1900s, Jewish immigrants in the early uh, 40s and 50s, uh, Puerto Rican immigrants. It's now a museum. Uh, so what we're talking about, what Dr. DeCibio has been talking about, is the current era of immigration. So it's a continuum. Dr. DeCibio is a PhD in uh, 
in um, political science at UCI. His uh, PhD is from the University of Texas, Austin. He also has a master's degree from that uh, school in Latin American studies. And as I mentioned, a BA in, uh, from Columbia University. Dr. Dr. Vicentio has written a number of books, at least three that I'm aware of, uh, one of which is going to be the topic that he's uh, talking to today, but also he's written uh, numerous uh, scholarly uh, uh, essays that are, that are generally available, and his books also are available uh, for, for general sale. So without any further discussion, back to Vicentio. Well, thank, thank you very much. While uh, my uh, PowerPoint is uh, coming up, um, I'll add to the tourist advice. Uh, should you be in New York, I, I also strongly recommend the Ellis Island Museum, uh, which is very, very well done and uh, okay. a nice pair to uh, the tenement. I will use the arrow. So uh, I want to thank, uh, thank Herb and thank the organization for the invitation. Um, and recognize their pressures. Um, when I was first invited, oh, I don't know, six months ago, they somehow knew that we would have an immigration crisis. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, I didn't predict it, but, but they were apparently aware. So usually when I give a talk like this, um, I give a little bit of history to sort of explain why we are where we are. I think because of the, the crisis, because of what's going on right now, I sort of want to start with the where we are and then I'll go backwards a little bit uh, to talk about sort of what I think we need to do. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So, you know, please don't hesitate to start thinking about them. And if I'm not clear, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, so where are we? Well, over the weekend or Thursday night, I guess, um, Title 42, the prohibition on immigration because of the COVID, uh, uh, COVID epidemic or COVID uh, pandemic, um, was lifted. This was necessary, or sort of not for reasons of immigration, but because you know the country is in some ways getting back to normal after the pandemic, and the at some point Congress would have forced uh, the president to lift it. So I think he, he made the decision, or his administration made the decision, uh, to suspend the uh, the the sort of recognition of the pandemic, but then also specifically Title Forty Two. Title 42 is a World War II era um, law that uh, uh, gives the executive branch added control over immigration during times of, of, of health crisis. Uh, President Trump used this um, to, I think, do what he wanted to do anyway, which was to uh, slow migration across the southern border. But when it was implemented, I think, you know, many people heard the knowledge this was of the the, you know, the first few months of the pandemic, that there was a reason that it was being done. Whether it needed to survive for three years as a, uh, a restriction on immigration, um, I, you know, I, well, the Biden administration thought not. They tried to lift it in the, the first year of their administration. So anyway, that was lifted. So what that means is where prior to Thursday, the immigration authorities could basically deport anybody that came uh, to either the southern border or the northern border. Um, they lost that ability. And that messaging, that, that sort of opportunity or potential opportunity um, was known in, in, in asylum seeking communities and folks that were trying to enter the United States. So there was a perception that there would be a growth in demand for asylum, people coming to the Southern border, asserting their rights under US and international law. Um, the consequence of this was a, a fear that over the weekend we would see a surge in, in demand at the southern border. That actually hasn't happened yet. We will, you know, <laughs> uh, whether it's this weekend or, you know, um, sometime in the fall. Summer is generally sort of a lower time um, for migration to the southern border because it's, you know, hard to get across Mexico um, and, and the heat um, makes that even worse. So, the, the these restrictions were suspended that led to sort of uh, Rhetoric um, from, from President Trump, you, former President Trump, you saw that in the CNN interview last week, and certainly from Republican leaders, that the border is uncontrolled um, and that this is um, after the responsibility of President Biden, the Biden administration. You've seen some talk of uh, perhaps impeaching um, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, my own guess, um, as sort of part of that conversation. 
Um, I, I think another reason that this suspension sort of got people's attention was that um, there's been a lot of engagement of folks that have been granted temporary residence in the United States after making claims of asylum over the last two years to places other than the border. So New York has gotten a large number of these migrants bucked in from, from, from Texas and from California. Um, Chicago has as well. Detroit, places that don't traditionally feel the heat of immigration um, are feeling it a little bit more. So you have some mayors, Democratic mayors in, in each of these cases, sort of also articulating some concern. Um, as much as, you know, it's, it's easy to sort of focus on the immigration in the news that we see, there's also immigration in the news that we don't see, and I, I, I think this should be recognized. Um, the Biden administration has relatively successfully returned to other and larger parts of our immigration policy making system to pre pandemic norms. Um, legal immigration, which numbers about a million people um, each year, these are folks that come in with green cards, um, is back roughly to the level that was before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, in, legal immigration has returned to its, its sort of status quo ante. I, it should be, I think, it needs to be a little bit larger, but that's sort of the level that we're we're um, processing at the moment. Um, naturalization has also not just returned to its pre-pandemic norms, but exceeded them a little bit. There was pent-up demand, um, so that we're now seeing eight or nine hundred thousand naturalization applications each year. These are folks who become citizens, you know, roughly equivalent to those of us that were born in the United States. Um, we're also seeing, I think, what is traditionally a driver of demands for immigration reform, that's low unemployment rates at historic lows. Um, and current unemployment rates, you know, in, in the 3% range, 3.2, 3.3% range, historically, that would be a point where you would see demands from the business community for expansions in immigration, both permanent, you know, legal permanent residents, green cards, but also um, guest workers. Um, you're seeing some of that, but that's sort of uh, muffled. So anyway, what, uh, how has uh, the Biden administration proposed um, replacing Title 42? Um, with a series of policies that I think are actually very reminiscent of what former President Trump tried to implement under his Remain in Mexico policy. Um, the Biden administration has uh, released some, some regulatory language um, that um, changes what had been a, a right in U.S. law or seeks to change what had been a right in U.S. law uh, to um, make an asylum claim to now establish a number of other requirements. One is that if you pass through a third party country coming into the United States. So basically, if you're not Mexican or Canadian, you're coming from someplace else, you have to have first applied for and been denied asylum in one of those, in, in one of the countries that you pass through. Um, obviously, it doesn't apply to Mexicans, it does not apply to Canadians. And there are actually Canadian, Canadian asylum applications, but anybody else would have had to apply somewhere along the way. Um, it, uh, uh, requires that people that are approaching the border in order to um, uh, seek asylum have an appointment, and this appointment is allocated through a, uh, a an, app, uh, an app on your phone. You know, I think all of us that have engaged those um, know that they don't always work very well. Well, they work even less well when you're passing through Mexico um, and probably using uh, uh, cell phones that are not perhaps as good as the ones that we have, and certainly you know don't have. Uh, Wi-Fi as good as we have. Um, if you don't meet one of those standards that you applied for asylum in a country that you passed through and have an app, you can immediately be turned away, but not only turned away, you can be deported. And that deportation is something that will be recorded. And if you are caught and deported, um, you cannot apply for asylum for five years. Um, so this is a very draconian sort of set of restrictions um, that are reminiscent of and in some ways exceed because they're more bureaucratically competent uh, the remain in Mexico policy that President Trump uh, tried to implement before um, the pandemic, before he had sort of the, the, the freedom, if you will, of, of Title 42. Now, let me acknowledge some challenges the Biden administration faces. You know, on, on paper, this seems well, that, that those are pretty absolute barriers. Well, there are huge challenges in communication. So how do you get the word out about Policy changes. You know, that I would have I had difficulty explaining to you all. You all are pretty, you know, thoughtful and, and read the news. Imagine you're in the the Darien Gap in, in in southern Costa Rica or sorry, southern Panama. My geography isn't always so great. Um, you know, how you're getting news about this isn't very clear. So there's a lot of um, 
uh, you know, there are certainly uh, emails or, or, or internet sort of uh, communications, whether these are accurate or not, aren't very clear. The group that is most likely to be presenting information are those that have a sort of financial advantage in getting you to the border smugglers. They're not giving particularly clear information. So even if all of these Biden administration policies, whether they're right or wrong, were you know, effective, whether that would get communicated was pretty unclear. Um, secondly, the Biden administration acknowledges that it cannot deport some um, uh, potential asylum applicants. Uh, the largest group of these are folks with which the countries from which they come from, we don't have agreements with. So we cannot deport folks that you know come to the Mexican border from Cuba because we don't have an agreement with Cuba to deport people back to Cuba. Um, and certainly there are you know, sort of parts of the world uh, where you know we, we don't have the ability to deport people even if we wanted to. Venezuela is probably the larger right now. Um, uh, the Biden administration has said that it will not deport uh, families with minor children. Um, so that's potentially another sort of large group of folks, you know, or even if, you know, even if, again, even if these policies were implemented um, effectively, um, that we have acknowledged that we can't deport. Um, and then finally, every policy, and certainly immigration policy, all have exceptions. And those exceptions will sort of feed into this broader sort of communication challenge that the Biden administration has. Um, and, um, uh, it, you know, make it make it more difficult um, to convince folks that maybe they shouldn't come to the United States. Um, the Biden administration has created some opportunities to apply for asylum abroad. This is a new policy. It, it really hasn't been implemented enough that I can give you an assessment of whether it's working or not. But we've made agreements with uh, Costa Rica, uh, with Ecuador, with Chile um, to have processing centers in those countries where um, asylum applications can be reviewed. Ask me in six months, and I'll give you a sense of whether that's that's been effective or not. So anyway, so that's that's the this is this weekend's news. The the sort of short term assessment is that applications or I'm sorry, people sort of showing up at um, immigration processing centers along the border are fewer than are expect than were expected. Again, whether that holds for weeks or months um, seems unlikely. Generally, the period where you see the highest uh, demand. Um, are the sort of late winter and, and, and early spring months. Again, transportation uh, is sort of safer and easier in that period. Needless to say, <laughs> late winter and spring is uh, during the presidential primaries and, and, and uh, uh, primaries for, for other federal offices. So this will be back in the news. <laughs> um, so let me now take the step back and say, well, what do we really need to do about immigration? Where, where, where are the what's necessary in order to sort of avoid this, this crisis and the periodic crises that we see. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, the getting lost in the short term masks a much bigger issue. And that is that we need immigrant labor in a way that we have historically at different points, as Herb uh, mentioned in my introduction, you know, and the United States economy was able to grow in the 1840s because of that large wave of, of Northern European, Irish, and German migration. It was able to grow in, in the late 19th century um, because of the, the huge wave of Southern and Eastern European migration. And that's where my ancestors come from. Um, it was able to grow in the 20th century in part with some domestic migration, African-Americans moving from the South, Puerto Ricans um, who are not technically immigrants uh, moving from Puerto Rico, but then also you know, beginning in the 1960s, the large wave of Latin American and, and Asian American migration that has, has reshaped County that has reshaped California, um, that has reshaped the country. Um, we're at another one of those sort of points where we need to rethink who we should be admitting in the future and what skills they should have and where they should be sort of directed um, into the economy. Um, and we have sort of tangible evidence of labor shortages. Um, you know, you can say, well, the overall unemployment rate masks that, but we know that there are still positions that are simply not being filled by native born workers in you know, the technology sector, um, in medicine, um, and in higher education. Universities you know, run on the best and brightest of the world, not just the best and brightest of the United States. Um, but also, the economy needs workers with more moderate skills. Um, agriculture and agricultural processing have relied on immigrant labor for over a century now in the United States. You simply can't find 
native born workers who will work in the fields or will work in agricultural processing. Um, healthcare services for an aging uh, population of uh, the, uh, the, the paraprofessionals that make <laughs> uh, healthcare livable to the extent that it is are increasingly folks who were born and trained abroad. There's a remarkable sort of statistic that 95% of nurses that have gotten um, uh, degree or nursing certifications in the country of Colombia now work in the United States. Well, that's a great contribution of Colombia to the United States. Um, and one that I think we're all very reliant on. Um, uh, seasonal labor um, and um, the service sector are all are, are a large part of the economy that can't, can't fill positions with, with native workers. Um, no, I'm not saying you know that, that each of these can individually be addressed through an immigration reform, but there can be some, some broad patterns that allow these sectors and other sectors of the economy that can't find workers um, to, uh, to, to fill those positions through immigration. Um, just to give you a sort of a sense of where the United States sits in the world, um, these are uh, population densities per square mile. It's not, not a great statistic and actually had to convert some of them from square kilometers because we're the only ones that use miles. But just to show you that the United States is a labor short country, it's a population short country and consequently a labor short mm -hmm. country. So, so if you take the land area of the world and divide the total number of people um, in the world, you get about 122 people per square mile. The United States is only at about two thirds of that, 89 people per square mile. Um, our allies and, and the other advanced democracies are all you know, much larger. So look at you know the UK has 673 people per square mile. Um, Taiwan, um, 1600 per square mile. So that just shows you that we are relatively short of people and consequently of labor um, to um, relative to other parts of the world. Australia, I point out, is in a much worse position than we are. They also have a much more aggressive immigration system than we do, recognizing that. I'm not actually, it doesn't show up very well here, and I apologize for that, but this just goes to show that sort of defeating and de defying or countering a myth, uh, the United States is not the country that has the highest share of immigrants. In fact, Canada, our neighbor to the north, has more, Australia has more in percentage terms. We're up there, but we're not. Um, at the top. And that is because we just don't have enough people to do what we need to be done um, here in the United States. Um, traditionally, the United States has had a great advantage. Um, this was the sort of place that, 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 that people have migrated historically and over the last <laughs> few centuries or so. Um, to the degree that we are increasingly sending a message of unwelcome, though, uh, we will certainly lose out um, in skilled migration. Um, to other parts of the world. And there's certainly a risk um, that we'll lose out in others. So um, what's how do we solve this problem? Well, this is the elusive goal, the goal that Congress has been working on or not really working. <laughs> Congress has periodically addressed for the last 20 years or so a, a comprehensive immigration reform. Um, the uh, uh, This sort of was first uh, debated uh, a revision to the, the current immigration law, which was passed in 1965, um, was first uh, debated by Congress in 2006, sort of late in the Bush administration. Um, the Senate actually passed a, a pretty reasonable bill at that point that addressed, you know, the, the various areas that needed to be addressed and came up with some compromises. Uh, House didn't take it up, so it didn't go anywhere. Um, the Senate again um, uh, debated a bill um, in 2013 um, the beginning of President Obama's second term, and quite remarkably, it not only won the votes of every Democrat in the Senate, but also of about a third of the Republicans. It had a, a filibuster-proof uh, majority. Again, a reasonable bill. I mean, we might not have liked parts of it, but uh, you know, compromise is what's necessary here. But again, the House didn't take it up, and and, and it went nowhere. So, what would this? What would? What is necessary in comprehensive? Um, immigration reform. Well, there has to be some conversation about um, the numbers of legal immigrants, immigrants to permanent residence, immigrants with green cards, those that have uh, the right to remain in the United States permanently. Um, currently, we allocate those um, in two, broadly in two ways. One is having an immediate relative in the United States who is a U.S. citizen or in some cases a permanent resident. Um, and the other is folks abroad that have job skills that are necessary um, in, in the U.S. economy. As I say, this leads to about um, a million um, immigrants to permanent residents every year. Uh, went down during the pandemic mostly because 
They just couldn't process the application, uh, but it's now back up in, in that range. A million is a big number. That's 10 million every decade. That's 3% of the national population um, through legal immigration. That is a pretty remarkable accomplishment. That said, it's if you look at, at or think about some of the uh, areas that I talked about um, on the last slide, it's probably not meeting our needs now. So we need to think about creating some expanded opportunities there um, and maybe some targeted opportunities for folks with uh, certain skills or folks in certain professions. Um, the Republicans might ask for evidence of greater connection to the United States. So arguably having a family member here um, is a connection to the United States. But there's been some conversation about a system somewhat like what Canada has, which would give extra rewards to folks that already speak English, um, the, to folks that have an advanced degree, whether that advanced degree is necessarily related to the, uh, per, the, 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 the profession that they might enter or not. Um, and I think those are sort of debate, you know, negotiable kinds of things in order to create a richer pool of, of legal immigrants to the United States. Um, I think a second piece in any comprehensive immigration reform would be guest workers to fill gaps that legal immigration can't fill. Certainly guest workers, um, you know, if we think of the history of California, uh, have sort of a, a have left sort of a bad taste in their mouths. The Bracero program would be an example. Um, you know, short-term agricultural labor, well, 20 years, but you know, short-term is policy-making term. Um, but truth be told, we have about 3 million guest workers uh, in the United States each year. Um, and for that number doesn't necessarily have to expand, what we would probably need is to think about giving guest workers more labor mobility so that they can move from one sector of the economy to another during a set period of residence, probably three years. Um, right now, the, the guest workers that we have are sort of trapped in their original contract with their original employer. And that um, gives, you know, it, it's it's not what the economy needs because you need more flexibility, but it also, I think, takes advantage of those workers. Um, a third piece um, is regularizing, legalizing the status of long-term undocumented immigrants resident in the United States. Um, this is the hardest one for for Republicans to swallow, but I think uh, a necessary piece of any comprehensive bill. The numbers of, uh, of long-term um, undocumented immigrants is about 10.5 million. You'll see higher numbers, but the higher numbers are to explain the real number is about 10.5 million. And that number has been dropping since the Bush administration. So you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem um, that is getting worse. The, the challenge here is that well over half of that 10.5 million um, have now resided in the United States for 15 years or more. So these are people that are part of our society that we've made commitments to, in many cases we've educated, you know, um, provided skill development. Um, there's a responsibility there. And I think that's, you know, as much as that's a non-starter for Republicans, it is a necessary piece for, for most Democrats. Um, and I think would have to be in a comprehensive bill. Um, uh, the piece that the Democrats will have a little bit of more of a problem with, and the Republicans certainly focus on a great deal, is new enforcement uh, to prevent the next round of undocumented immigrants. Um, and enforcement here is not what, what President Trump focused on, you know, sort of building a wall along the border, over half of undocumented immigrants cross the border legally and then um, overstay a visa or something, but would mean more invasive kinds of monitoring of workplaces um, to ensure that long, you know, that folks who didn't have legal work status would be able to work. The easiest way to deal with this, and I know the libertarians in the in the audience would not be comfortable with this, is a national ID card. Uh, most of our European ally or most of the advanced economies in Europe have some form of a national ID card that's necessary to, to work to, to get health care. Um, we interestingly both the right and the left sort of object to this. Uh, but I think would be an effective means of um, controlling unauthorized migration in the future. And the final piece of comprehensive immigration reform, and this is the crisis that we're experiencing now, um, is new refugee asylum policies um, that reflect um, the U.S. position in the world. Refugee and asylum policy has, since World War II, been very much a part of U.S. foreign policy, rewarding uh, folks that... Uh, um, supported the United States um, and then lost, so Cubans, uh, uh, and uh, punishing those who opposed United States goals abroad. 
Um, I think we need, need a more neutral policy and one that's not in the control of the executive branch, uh, but instead in the control of Congress, which is where the rest of, of immigration policy lies. Um, comprehensive reform might include three other things. Um, I think simplification of naturalization is probably called for. Um, uh, I can talk about that in questions if you're interested. Um, sharing the financial cost of immigration more appropriately between the federal government and the states. Um, the states pay all the prices for the price for immigration. This is what led to Proposition 187, you know, K 12 education. And the federal government gets all the benefit. And immigrants are a net economic benefit, but that net benefit is mostly going to the federal government. Um, so, you know, some, some sort of equalization of that over time. Um, and I think a responsibility um, as part of immigration reform is to recognize that some native workers are, in fact, disadvantaged by immigration policies here, particularly um, low, lower skilled workers. Um, so, additional training thought of as an immigration policy um, for. Um, uh, native workers who are displaced uh, by immigrant labor. So this is this is comprehensive immigration reform. This is what that 2006 Senate bill did. This is what the 2013 Senate bill did. You know, we could quibble around the edges, but you know, uh, the, the, they came up with compromises on each of these issues. Um, unfortunately, I think in the modern political world, uh, we don't really see uh, incentives uh, to come up with those compromises. Um, these are Gallup data um, going back to the 1960s, asking the question of whether um, immigration should be kept at its present level, increased or decreased. And mm -hmm. you see that historically, um, you know, the uh, uh, kept at present level and, and decreased sort of dominated the, the policy debate and a handful of people um, thought it should be increased. As the economy has demanded for immigrants, however, we've seen that, that increased share grow and now, they are roughly evenly split, um, a third, a third, a third for each of those positions. That's a very challenging position uh, for um, elected leaders to, you know, sort of suss out uh, where, how they find a compromise. Um, the div divisions, not surprisingly, are also very partisan. Um, so answering, if this is from the, uh, the comprehensive exit poll, the national exit poll from the 2022 elections, um, uh, three quarters of Democrats uh, take the position that immigrants um, help the country, um, and four out of five Republicans um, say that immigrants hurt the country. Again, <laughs> hard to find the middle ground between those two positions. Um, and um, you know, despite the fact that the Republican Party sort of used to include among its sort of coalition um, business owners, particularly small business owners, who overwhelmingly benefited from the labor of immigrants, um, the rhetoric uh, over the last 15 years or so since um, President Bush, who criticized on a lot of, for a lot of reasons on immigration, he was actually a pretty good guy, um, ineffective, but good. Um, uh, that, that, that sort of, that segment of the Republican Party um, has been long. So what about the Biden administration? Um, is, you know, I've given sort of versions of this talk in both at scholarly conferences, but also to community audiences, and I think I initially characterized the Biden administration as just neglecting immigrants. And that's not entirely true, but, but large, it was largely true. Um, then I sort of went to sort of, well, it's messaging and what they're really concerned about is, you know, 2024. And, you know, even though they're doing a few good things, it's, it's all getting lost and, and certainly in some, um, in some very harsh rhetoric. Um, I think the proposals that have come out in the last couple of weeks um, in terms of, uh, of a asylum policy um, uh, suggest that it's neither neglect or messaging, but actually a very harsh and, and um, you know, a harsh set of policies that reflect a fundamental change in the way we think about our responsibility uh, to people abroad. So let me acknowledge um, that the Biden administration at least began with a flourish. Um, they followed through on campaign promises to propose uh, immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform very early in the administration. Within the first week, they put out a nice, glossy um, uh, web page. Um, it may have been backed up with other things, but the web page was the, 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 what everybody saw um, that was modeled very much on the 2013 uh, bipartisan legislation. So it addressed those five topics that I talked about. Um, here, you know, Biden is a creature of the Senate, and I think he still thinks there's a Senate out there um, that. Uh, <laughs> Did we pass that sort of legislation under the right circumstances? I think there might be a Senate. It's the House. It's really the problem. But you know, uh, nevertheless, um, but almost immediately after putting out that proposal, 
um, other legislative priorities to precedent. And I don't want to minimize those other legislative priorities. And certainly the accomplishments of the first two years of the Biden administration in terms of, of legislation were surprising um, and I think were, were overwhelmingly positive. But the immigration was not a part of that um, rhetoric. So the bill of, of peaceful legislation was introduced. It, it went nowhere. Um, whenever the Biden administration would turn to immigration for whatever reason, again, messaging, um, frequently messaging, a crisis at the border would appear. And I think we're going to periodically see those crises because that is just the nature of the sort of position the United States is in vis-a-vis folks desiring to immigrate. Um, and the response of the Biden administration has been increasingly draconian. Um, so the Biden administration has used its executive authority to undo some of what President Trump implemented, um, tried to uh, lift Title 42 last year, you know, not because the, the health crisis ended, but just out of good policy, uh, but um, the courts blocked that um, and ended, at least rhetorically, the Remain in Mexico policy, though we've recreated that just under another name. Um, Biden, uh, to his credit, or the Biden administration, to his credit, uh, did refocus immigration enforcement. Uh, President Trump, on in his first week in office, basically said that any undocumented immigrant was the, the target of, of U.S. enforcement efforts. Um, Biden went back to the Obama policy, was, which was to focus enforcement efforts on folks that had outstanding orders of deportation um, or had committed crimes. Um, the... Um, the Biden administration has also reversed the Trump era policies by being more sensitive, but not, you know, the proof will be in the pudding on this, um, to asylum applicants with minor children in, you know, at the time of, of the uh, asylum application. So um, this, by way of conclusion, I want to sort of think about contemporary immigration policy and the frame here is, is the notion of the uneven road. I've written a book, The Uneven Roads of uh, race and ethnic politics. So, you know, this is the uneven road of immigration policy. Um, the Trump victory in, in 2016, I think, reinforced and hardened immigration restriction in voice. He framed his campaign, you know, from coming down that escalator at Trump Tower around the, the perfidity of, of Mexicans and whether a few of them were good or not. Um, he distinguished himself as a candidate, both in the Republican primary and, and in the general election. Um, by being more restrictionist, more more of an immigration hardliner, more particularly anti-Mexican, but but anti-Latino broadly, um, than his opponents, which in the Republican primary I think allowed him to distinguish himself from Ted Cruz, distinguish himself from Marco Rubio, um, distinguish himself um, from the others in the early primaries and, and get the nomination. Um, that got the handful of immigration moderates that remained in the, in the Republican Party in 2016 and 2018. Um, in his administration, the court became sort of a, a, a an immigration policy player in a way that uh, uh, they hadn't been before. You know, the, the challenge to his to the Muslim ban, which went to the Supreme Court, the challenge to DACA, which is moving its way back up through the courts. Um, the, the courts have become very much centrally positioned in the immigration policy debates in a way that they simply weren't before um, the Trump administration. Um, President Biden admittedly has limited degrees of freedom. Um, the Democratic coalition is a little bit more divided. Those numbers that I showed you suggest that. Um, then there's the Republican coalition. And where that particularly manifests itself um, is in the Republican, I'm sorry, in the Democratic coalition in the Senate, where it's not altogether clear to me that a Joe Manchin or Christian Sinema um, would actually vote for a conference of bill, let alone needing 10 Republicans to, to overcome to overcome the filibuster. Um, as a result, immigration has just not been a personal or administration priority um, during the first two years of the Biden administration. Um, I, it's easy to sort of, in a conversation like this, focus on the politics of it. I mean, it's the politics that are the problem. Um, but uh, the U.S. needs conference of immigration reform. Our current immigration law is now 50 years old. It's not meeting the needs of the economy. It's not meeting, meeting the needs of families in the United States. It's not meeting the needs of 10 million um, unauthorized immigrants, the majority of whom have resided in the United States for over 15 years. Um, it's time for a change, and a change that will not, would certainly not satisfy everybody in this room or satisfy me, but a change that addresses each of those five um, areas that I identified. So on that note, 
um, I will uh, turn it over to you and uh, be happy to answer some questions. Uh, let me just preface this by saying, what question me? <laughs> it does not have declarative sentences in it. It has a question mark at the end and it's short. Okay, so no speeches, only questions. <laughs> with that in mind. Not my rule, but I'll go with it. <laughs> Uh, do, do we have a mic for the audience? Or? No, we don't. So we have to. I'll repeat the question. Is there any data on the education levels of the migrants? Um, in other words, are there any better educated ones that can meet the needs of the? Economy? So his question is about the education level of immigrants. Um, th there's a great range, is the answer. Certainly, folks that are brought in under that part of the current immigration law that looks for people that. Are meeting the needs of the U.S. economy. Some of them are, you know, at the far end. You know, have better degrees than I do. Um, and not, not to put myself in that, but you know, I've, I've done what you're supposed to do. I have a PhD. But you know, a lot of people at that end, certainly in the tech sector. Um, but I don't. But there are also folks that come in, certainly under the family preference visas, that don't have high levels of formal education, but have practical experience and work skills that are necessary for the U.S. economy. So I don't. I, I think. Thinking about education is one dimension that we should think about, but I don't think that could be the only focus. Um, for what it's worth, folks that immigrants generally have higher levels of education than the low skill US workers that they're sometimes competing for with jobs, just because they are the elites of their countries of origin. And you know they come in and, and do work that is, at least in their initial time in the United States, a little bit beneath them um, in the back. Uh, what do you think about the new law that just passed in Florida saying that anyone who aids an illegal immigrant in any way can be fined up to a thousand dollars or more? So, so the question is about a, a new piece of legislation in Florida um, that criminalizes assisting um, um, unauthorized immigrants. And um, here, assisting could, you know, could be. Yeah, driving as a doctor, but it could also be aiding a family member, your grandmother, for example. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of bring it up. Um, a similar law was passed um, in Arizona uh, about 15 years ago now. Um, and the courts held some of it to be constitutional and some of it to be unconstitutional. Um, but the aiding part was was in the, the part that was thrown out. So I suspect that when that's challenged, it will uh, be rejected. That said, we have a different judiciary than we had 15 years ago. Uh, but um, you know, it's it, it, the uh, the sort of this, traditionally the courts do recognize a sphere of family, and that would you know taking the grandmother to the doctor is within that sphere of family. Uh, a recent article indicated that the immigration courts, including the staffing, the judges. Uh, Understaffed, grossly understaffed. Is that to what extent is that a problem? So the question is about the immigration courts. And just to be clear, the immigration courts are not Article Three courts. They're not the uh, you know the the folks that have lifetime tenure. They are part of the executive branch um, and are hired hired and in principle fired. Um, you know, as any civil servant can be. So yeah. So the question is, are they understaffed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, could could they hire enough people to deal with the potential five-year backlog that they currently have? Probably not. Um, first of all, require an appropriation from Congress. You know, these are skilled lawyers, or they're lawyers, and presumably skilled lawyers um, that are you know don't come cheap. Um, and they're often, as with a lot of the positions in the immigration bureaucracy, in places where people don't want to. That I, I'm showing my own biases. Um, <laughs> places where it's harder to convince people to work, you know, near near the border in rural Texas, um, for example. Um, and you know, so it's not even if you had the money and uh, and expanded, uh, you know, and, and the, the the FTE to hire the person, getting somebody into the right position is a little bit tricky. President Biden is committed to uh, doubling the size of the immigration um, uh, judicial the the the, the uh, immigration uh, judges. Um, they've gotten about a third of the way to that goal, um, which is probably an accomplishment. Um, but you know, Congress isn't bending over backwards to appropriate more money for it. But that would certainly help. Yes. So.
So the question is about the the busloads of of, of uh, uh, asylum folks that have been granted sort of temporary residence in the United States while their cases are being processed or being sent um, to places where they weren't traditionally sent. So the uh, the Naval Observatory, which conveniently is the uh, the home of uh, Vice President Harris. Um, this, I think, yeah, obviously, <laughs> this is a, uh, a, a strategic decision on the part of uh, border state governors. Um, I think it's probably a smart political decision. Um, and at least initially, um, the cities of the Northeast, where, where, the, where they were originally sent, um, created a, a set of resources to receive them. You know, they booked, you know, unused uh, hotels and they put them into the, uh, uh, their social service uh, bureaucracy. The challenge is the numbers are now exceeding what those cities have the resources to handle. Um, and that's bringing the immigration issue home to parts of the country that really haven't sort of felt the, the brunt of immigration for, for many, many years. Um, I think it raises, I mean, I, to me, it's sort of further evidence that we need to think about this question of funding that I raised um, in terms of immigration, where the federal government takes on more responsibilities. But again, that would take an appropriation by Congress, so that's probably not going to happen um, in the short term. Um, I think those cities are starting to feel that, you know, they're at their limits. Um, I would balance that with the fact that a lot of the border cities and the major cities along the border have been at their limits for you know mm -hmm. a long time and haven't gotten a lot of support from the federal government either. Um, so to the degree that this is a policy that we as a country are committed to, and it is, I mean, it isn't, <laughs> it should be, um, I think we need to find resources to um, uh, facilitate the, you know, diminishing the cost to localities of, of asylum policy. Um, there used to be a very successful program of relocating books that had been awarded either refugee status or, or asylum, um, but the Trump administration sort of gutted that and then you know the pandemic uh, further gutted that. Rebuilding it will take time. Sure. You mentioned a brain drain earlier tonight. Given, um, given our unwelcoming attitude towards it now and our only attack in certain states on education the idea of a brain drain both in America and in our immigration policy a brain drain of skilled personnel period well uh, the brain I'm sorry so the question is um how do I see a brain drain for, for a variety of reasons the brain drain that I, I think I mentioned was actually a brain drain to the nation of Colombia that had lost a large number of its skilled workers in a specific sector, nursing, uh, to the U.S. economy. Do you see it happening here? Given yes. Uh, so the question is, do I do I see it here? Yeah, to, to the degree that, at least in the, you know the, the the higher skilled workers, the tech sector particularly, a lot of those, the folks that have those that training can choose to go here, can choose to go to Ireland, can choose to go to uh, to Taiwan, and historically we have been the the sort of chosen destination of many of those because of our investment in higher education, um, our, you know, the, the, the tech sector and before that, the, the industrial sector that we had. Um, we run a risk that we will lose the, the most skilled, the most mobile workers over time. Um, and, you know, we've sort of relied, you know, the growth of the United States has relied on not just, you know, sort of the, the low skill worker that we tend to sort of have as our, our image of uh, uh, of immigrants over time, but also the more skilled ones are the ones that had the entrepreneurial skills that were able to turn you know the the, res the limited resources they had into uh, economic contributions. And certainly, if you look at sort of the you know, founders of major companies, you can find a lot of folks that were born abroad. Huge number of small businesses. Yeah. So so yeah, there is a risk over time that if we don't reform our immigration. System in a in a comprehensive sense, not you know just deal with the, this asylum issue along the border. That some of some subset of those migrants that could come here will go elsewhere. We don't have evidence on that yet, but you know we we see that other tech sectors are emerging in different parts of the world, and it was probably a bigger problem uh, when we faced you know sort of a, a European Union that included the uh, UK as, as well or the Eurozone. Yes, as a nation that is primarily immigrants mm -hmm. and has a Statue of Liberty thing, you know, but we've never been kind to immigrants. And so what's different about now 
to the 30s and the 40s and, and all of the different immigrants? Is so the question is, what is different now than the past? And interestingly, you pick the 30s and the 40s. The 30s and the 40s were actually the period of our, our greatest restriction. Um, coming out of the sort of national reaction to World War One and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the mm -hmm. sort of resentment uh, uh, about you know southern and eastern European migrants, you know, after a big wave of immigration, um, we passed the national origin quota laws in 1921 and 24, which created those sort of lowest levels of, of legal immigration in the US. Now the depression probably <laughs> reinforced that. Um, so the question is we've always we've always been nasty, what's different now? We need the immigrants more now than we did in the past. Um, when in in those earlier eras where at the local level um, there were certainly, you know, you know, no Irish need apply, and you know, we can come up with with analogs for for other groups. There were certainly a great deal. There were barriers for immigrants. Um, the economy, when it demanded immigrants, was able to overcome those local level resentments or, or racism or yeah. or ethnicism, um, and you know, lead to a great growth in immigration in the 1830s and 1840s, and then in the 1870s through the 19 teens, and then again in the 1960s. You know when the economy grew again. Um, we're now at a point where the economy is demonstrating that need, but the policymakers aren't responding to that need. Uh, yes. If we make the 2013 bipartisan thing of legislation, how does it deal with the undocumented? Um, so the question is that 2013 bill, um, how did it deal with the undocumented, the, the bipartisan legislation? Um, it created a, I forget what color it was, some new visa. Um, that would create a period of temporary, temporary but legal residence for folks that had been here more than three years or five years. It created some some time period. If you were above that level, you got temporary residence for a year or two, and then you could apply for permanent residence. But there would be processing delays, but you would then have that five-year wait before naturalization. The estimates were at the time that it would take about 10 years for most then undocumented people to become documented. And I think there was a slightly quicker path for what we think of now as the dreamers, you know, young adults, then young adults who came as kids. Um, to my mind, sort of whatever barriers Congress wants to enact, that's fine as part of a compromise, as long as there is a a, a status so that you can work while you're on that path and then an end point. Um, and that's sort of what the 2006 bill had with the 2013 bill. It's gotten more restrictive without question. Um, and the model that we have for this is the last large scale legalization, uh, which was in um, uh, 1986. Uh, President Reagan signed it into law. Um, and uh, this was the Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA. Um, and then there was a you had to have been resident, it was passed in 86, you had to have been resident since 81, and then you had sort of, the, I think it was a year or two of temporary status, and then three years of permanent status, and then you could apply for citizenship. By 2000, so about 2 million people were able to legalize under that uh, law. Um, by 2001, only half had become citizens. So, you know, if that's the end goal in our minds, it may not be the end goal in, 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 in undocumented immigrants' minds, but nevertheless, you know, two million people were able to regularize their status and work, and, you know, um, and uh, contribute more comfortably uh, to U.S. society. So Congress will create a lot of barriers. The left will say, "Oh, that's terrible." I'm willing to shrug. Could you discuss a little bit the cost of becoming a citizen? Sure. The economic cost. Well, uh, so the the question was the cost of becoming a citizen. I was hearing you more literally. Um, the application fee is about seven hundred dollars. Um, 600 is a fee that goes to the government, 100 is for biometrics. Um, you have to pass a, a civics test, um, and it varies from time to time. It's a lot like the driver's license test right now. <laughs> um, and um, you have to uh, demonstrate the ability to speak, read, and write English. That is waived if you're over 55 and have been here 15 years or over 60 and been here 20 years. Um, and then there's a bureaucratic a bureaucratic barrier because of, you know, it's a confusing bureaucracy. On um, that said, as I said, about seven, 800,000 people successfully get through that process every year. So 
it, it may be an annoying process, but it's one that can be easily surmounted. But you were asking, I think, maybe a, a deeper question, which was the sort of economic changes that can come through naturalization. Um, you're, uh, you are eligible for a wider range of jobs, including some public employment um, that is restricted uh, to US citizens. Um, you're um, eligible at the time of retirement for full social security benefits if you're a US citizen. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that if you naturalize, your kids are more likely, kids who might be US citizens by birth are more likely to be politically engaged. So the process of sort of voluntarily connecting to the US has an intergenerational effect. Um, I'm not sure if I have answered your question. Democrats would do a better job of selling public the benefit of reform. You know, you're asking the wrong. So the question is, could, can the Democrats do a better job of selling the benefits of reform? And I think you're asking the wrong person because to me, they're so manifestly obvious. I don't know why we haven't, why we didn't just resolve this under the Bush administration and give him all the credit. Be happy with that. Because um, in the past, and this sort of gets to your question as well, in the past we've sort of gotten to the point of crisis and then we've, we've modernized the law. Um, and that modernization in one case was a bad modernization, the national origin quotas, but usually it was to address the economic needs of that country. And that's why I sort of frame this around the economics of immigration rather than the, the very legitimate sort of family concerns and, and human rights kinds of concerns. Um, because it's ultimately the economy that will drive Congress to act, or at least has in the past. And that's why something is askew right now. Um, so yes, yeah, should the Democrats do a better job? I think so. I, I think President Obama, you know, really genuinely tried. He thought that if he could show the Republicans that enforcement worked and that a Democrat was serious about enforcement, um, that they would come around and vote for comprehensive immigration reform, you know, listening to the economic wing of their party. So he became the deporter in chief. Um, and, you know, he, to this day, more people have been deported under the first Obama administration than any other four years in American uh, history. He thought the deal was, okay, I'll do that for a while, then we'll take up comprehensive immigration reform. And to some degree, he, that was paid off in the, the Senate in 2013, passed a reasonable, you know, a, a good enough bill. Um, the House, by that point, was feeling sort of the pressure of being primaried rather than competition in the general election, so they couldn't get enough um, Republicans to, um, uh, you know, to, to pressure who was then speaker. Was it Boehner at that point? Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, to, to pass a bill mostly on Democratic votes, but with you know, 50 or so Republicans. Um, he invoked the Hafter rule that a bill would only come to the floor if... A majority of the majority caucus supported it. Um, the Republicans ultimately would have been smart to have passed the bill in 2013 because it would have sort of moved, A, it would have been good for the economy, and it would have undercut some of the, the pressure that I think led to the, uh, the Trump candidacy. Um, but, you know, hindsight is 2020. I, my opinion, that I never. But uh, you get the fake rules. <laughs> You know, all these good points you make, I, I mean, I don't hear them on the news, and I listen to political shows all the time. So so uh, the observation was that um, these points They're not making them. may have made sense, but people aren't making them um, in public forum. I think they're not making them because, at least since President Obama, no Democratic president, which means <laughs> President Biden, has been willing to put immigration front and center and to take the hits to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that, you know, I could pull the audience, but you know, maybe funding the second round of pandemic relief and getting the um, Inflation Reduction Act passed, and you know, that was more important. But those, when you make that decision, you're constant, you know, you're you're pushing this one off to the future. Um, and arguably, this is as important as environmental kinds of concerns for the medium and long-term future of the United States. Do you think that 
friendship part from San Diego and the Biden administration position on that? Uh, so the question is, Friendship Park in San Diego, which I can talk about, but I don't know the Biden administration policy. So. Okay. 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 Should we build epic schools and destroy a historical 50-year state park and leave Governor Gap Gavin Newsom to lobby Biden if only Biden can save the park? We will be friends with Friendship Park on working on your deal, but it's just Yeah, it's sort of a, it has a splatted wall so that you can be in more immediate contact with family members abroad. Now there are two walls. Yeah. And there's the Trump era wall. Oh. And no, people, the people were stuck to see them last weekend. It was out on Saturday. Similar to the picture that you showed, you can't imagine the military. Can you change your guess as to where the next group of immigrants we're not going to like. <laughs> uh, so the question is, where are the next group of immigrants that we're not going to like are going to come from? Um, you know, considering the Ukraine and sort of what's going on um, in, in different parts of Eastern Europe, I, I would not be surprised at all if we start getting uh, away from, from that part of the world. Um, so the, the process just, so you know, obviously, <laughs> is a lot of Latin American countries have relatively lacked visa rules for some other countries. And then none, none of universal Ecuador for a long time was sort of one that had to lack. So, so people would fly into Ecuador and then, you know, come north. And increasingly coming north is not what it used to be, which is then flying from Ecuador to someplace else, but coming overland through, through the Darien Gap, which is not a pleasant uh, prospect for, for anybody, but is now so, so routinely trafficked that it's actually oddly become a little bit safer. Um, and, um, you know, and then then through Mexico and, 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 and to the Southern border. So, you know, where we think of these policies often as being sort of focused on Latin America, um, the, the, the range of people uh, at the, at the US, various US-Mexico entry points are really from all over the world now. <clears throat> yeah. So a policy was created uh, 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 sort of immediately after the, the start of the Ukraine war where um, family members here could, spawn, could, could demonstrate that they had the financial ability to support um, an asylum seeker from, from Ukraine and, and that person got sort of an expedited um, entry. Um, so the, the comment was that folks from Afghanistan are, are, are a larger number in greater need. And, and part of the history of the United States has been that if you want to be in an immigrant group that gets to come to the United States, be on the losing side of a war mm -hmm. uh, that the United States supported. Right, the losing side where we're on the, yeah. the side of the war. So, so, you know, when I was a school teacher, I had Iranians come through my classes. I had Vietnamese, both people come through my classes. And there was no uproar about that. Yeah. You know, um, we go to a place and mess it up. And then we accept those immigrants. Um, and I'm not sure whether you, you can or want to answer this, but if you had my orchestra's job, any thoughts on how you might do anything differently? Uh, so the question is, if I had uh, the, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security's job, would I? What would I do differently? I would never get confirmed. So let's care about it. Um, if you got confirmed. <laughs> And I should also acknowledge that for a good three or four years, my boss, through several level, levels, was uh, Jenna Napolitano, who, of course, had, had held it, had held that position. Um, I, uh, I mean, my orcus is my orcus, The White House is setting policy, not Homeland Security. So I, I, 
I think he is doing an adequate job under the under that scenario. It's not, I doubt that he is doing what he thinks is necessarily right, but he's recognizing the political imperatives um, that are coming to the White House. And you know, broadly, he can, as I've said here a little bit, point out that relative to Trump, <laughs> Biden has done, has done better in a number of ways. Um, I He cannot be at all concerned about um, his impeachment. First of all, the Senate will not vote to convict. Um, but that will sort of absorb, you know, the energies of his political people uh, in Homeland Security. I guess I also, you know, I, let me take this back. You know, I complimented President Bush earlier. Um, I think the creation of the Department of Homeland Security was a mistake in that it is just much too big a bureaucracy um, for any single person to manage, you know, whether competent or, competent or, or, or not. So we should, perhaps as part of immigration reform, or perhaps as part of a, a different conversation about national security, think about sort of different pieces of the Department of Homeland Security that reasonably cohere and thinking about those as separate separate agencies. You know, the Homeland Security was created in response to 9-11. And I think, you know, just as, you know, we can understand why some things were done early in the pandemic, we can understand remembering how we all reacted to 9-11. Uh, but we need to rethink that now. Um, to you know, now that we've seen you know a very different sort of set of responsibilities that often come into conflict with each other. So I, I guess I'm defending um, uh, Secretary Mayorkas here. Um, I, you know, he's he's not setting. He's he's not the one determining the political objectives. What if you were president? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you know, even less likely to be elected, but. <laughs> No, I mean, my biases are, are such that, you know, I would raise, I would think of immigration reform and even losing on immigration reform um, as a necessary responsibility as a, I, I am a progressive, as a progressive president. Um, I respect the decisions that the Obama administration made um, to, you know, try to play by the old rules and convince Republicans that enforcement uh, could work. Um, but we've learned from that lesson. It, that isn't enough to get them on board. So we need, you know, we need, I guess, so let me, I'm sort of thinking it might be, here's the question for me as president. Would I be willing to not go for comprehensive and take and do it piecemeal? I've always, my principal position has always been that you do the comprehensive because that forces everybody to compromise about everything. So, you know, Democrats lose on enforcement, Republicans lose on legalization, and you know everybody's either happy or unhappy, but it's the only way you get both of those dealt with. Um, I think we have seen the failure of comprehensive reform for so long now that we might have to go for piecemeal, um, that there is probably enough support out there for a more focused legalization, focused on the dreamers, maybe expanding the age limits by a little bit. Um, so don't go for legalizing seven or eight million, go for legalizing four million, maybe you can get that. Um, I'm willing to have a national ID card. I don't know that anybody in the room is, um, but you know, I'm willing to sacrifice a few of my civil liberties to achieve some, some broader goals. So maybe I'm, that would be me as president, sort of seeing if I could get the pieces where 10 years ago, I would have said, that's a bad, bad way to go. Thank you very much for answering. Sir. The, uh, we hear a lot about that we just don't have enough people to fill high-level technology uh, positions, and I'm wondering what the, the trend is. Are, are we importing our high-level technology uh, workers in greater numbers uh, year after year? So the question is, um, are we uh, are uh, are we are over time do we see a higher share of high-tech workers coming in? Um, the answer is no, for two reasons. One is a large share of them come in on temporary visas. Um, and that number is statutorily set by Congress. So, and it hasn't gone up in recent years. So we're not getting more in those sort of short-term uh, pathway. Um, the employers can petition through legal immigration, you know, through the, the legal immigration means, uh, but the it's a sort of a complicated bureaucratic process without a great guarantee of success. So the share that are coming in through that pathway is more limited. I think where we're seeing more is offshoring, you know, so that U.S. companies are employing people abroad who may not actually be abroad that whole time uh, to do a lot of those jobs. Uh, but you know, I don't want to just. Put, I mean, the high tech workers are sort of easy to easy to get our mind around. Um, I like to think about nurses and you know 
X-ray technicians and um, you know all of those sorts of para nurses, aides, all those sort of paraprofessional positions that you know were increasingly dependent on, and those are and have been for twenty years largely immigrant uh, immigrant populations, and we don't we're not getting them either. We're getting those through the legal immigration pathway, but not people who said I was a nurse's aide or a uh, an X-ray technician, but came and got that certification and then moved into those positions. Now I think we have to be more affirmative about recruiting those people abroad and giving them either some stat, you know, three-year temporary status or a passive legal immigration. Uh, on that note, uh, there was a story today, I think it was CNN I was watching, I'm not sure, uh, about this law in Florida. Uh, they interviewed a woman who administered the hospital, a man who owned a construction company, and another man who was in the farm. He said, their workers are leaving before this law takes effect. I think it's June first. Mm -hmm. They're leaving because they don't want to get caught and go to jail or get deported and never be able to come back to work. So he said there was a construction man. He said my construction thing is down. There was no people there working. Mm -hmm. The administrator of the hospital said that they are like on the support positions that we were just talking about. 50%, she could buy, she could find 50 more people to get to run her hospital properly, and she can't get them. And the same thing for the farmer, you know, so the, the, the crop provides. So Florida is going to have really, really big economic issues in this law. Oh, no. Really, really. <laughs> That's the They win the project. Big I could try to summarize that, but did everybody hear it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the far back. So the question is sort of why the, the the sort of business sector that used that is a part of the Republican coalition and used to be more dominant in the Republican coalition is uh, uh, enabling um, the the you know anti-immigrant um, wing of the Republican Party and I, I think the answer is short-term political gains and you know the <laughs> the the uh, in a highly polarized system like we have where each election can really tip the outcome to one you know one party or the other you know 70,000 votes each in the last two elections um you make alliances that get serve your short-term interest and hope that in the long term you can find another way to get some workers um but over time certainly that is a a, a short-sighted strategy that uh, uh hurts the hurts the country as a whole let alone yeah. the business What impact do you think that recent rise in overt racism um, in the country supports the anti-immigrant stance? So the question. What's the question? To I what didn't hear the question. Like, to what extent? Why don't you use the mic? Let's hear right up here. <laughs> to what extent do you think? that the trend toward more overt, overt racism in our country being expressed in social media and then by political leaders, that that is what is driving what was seen to be Republicans primarily opposed to immigration because it feeds into that narrative that Trump started against Asians against Mexicans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I might reverse it because the I think it is the, the the fear of the change. So the the fear of the immigrants is actually underpinning some of the racism that we're seeing. Um, so the you know the, the country is without question going through a massive demographic change. Um, conveniently, um, the country passed. 200 million people in 1966, which was the year after the last immigration reform that led to sort of large scale Asian and, and Latino migration. And hit 300 million 
2006 or 7, I forget exactly. Of that, the last 100 million, if you will, um, two thirds were either immigrants or the children. So, you know, we are going through a change in the country, and that's going to continue, sort of, you know, whether President Trump is reelected in 2024 or not, because so much is sort of baked into baked into the demography. Um, people are seeing that change and fear it, whether they understand explicitly what they fear or not. And that, I think, has led to some of the emergence of politics of the right, the Tea Party movement in, you know, in 2010, uh, President Trump in 2016. Um, so the, the, the fear of that change and that their kids may not have the same opportunities that they perceive they have is driving a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the nativism that we're seeing. It manifests itself certainly as racism, racism against those groups and, and against African Americans, but it also, I think it is deeper than that in that it, it, it you know, it, it is a country that is emerging that they don't quite understand. You know, we, actually, I, I have to be careful about Orange County because Orange County was a very different place. Uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, well, it's when I moved here, so. <laughs> um, you're not your fault. Yeah, it's not, um, you're welcome. Um, you know, the, the, we've sort of, we, we have come to terms, we on the coast, I'm not gonna overgeneralize, I've sort of come to terms with these changes, but you know, in in part, you know, rural Arkansas, where you really didn't get immigrants until Walmart started bringing them in to process chickens in in in, in, in the two thousand in the first decade of the of the twenty first century. Um, uh, my mom passed away about a year ago, and coincidentally, this weekend we're going to the small town in Kansas where she was born and where she's asked that her actors be. I'm spread on her parents' grave. So I'll be violating the law in Kansas if anybody hears my arrest. Right. Um, I looked at this small town population of 2000, I think it was less there in 1968. Sorry? Name of it. Harper. Harper. Harper, Kansas. About 45 miles uh, southwest of Wichita. Not Wichita. Anyway, there's now a Mexican restaurant there. <laughs> I can assure you that when my grandparents lived there, so, so that, that change is coming and, and we're sort of seeing it in different ways. And, so we've processed it in different ways, and I think that's leading to the this underlying sense of loss that, that President Trump, whether you agree with him or not, very effectively articulated of making America great again. That greatness was before. Well, that yeah, but he didn't he didn't have to say that because great meant what? Um, so I, 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 I've, I've gone off on a tangent from your question, but. Um, they're related, and I think it's the the change that has come from post sixty five immigration that is leading to a lot of the racism that is manifested today. Yeah, yeah. That's just an observation and question I was asked about technology, mm -hmm. uh, technical people. About twenty years ago, uh, the dean of the UCIA uh, engineering school, uh, in the speech that I attended, made the point that if it were not for uh, overseas uh, graduate students, there would be no UCI engineering graduate program. Mm -hmm. And I thought that spoke volumes about mm -hmm. the state of our technology. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, we in, in higher education have sort of always taken for granted that we can hire from wherever we want in the world because we want to be the best. And, and you know, until recently, that was, I think, sort of a national consensus. We need to push back on that. I mean, the, you know, the, the pushback from the state legislature in California about the admission of international undergraduates, even though they pay more than their own way. Um, you know, the uh, challenges that I think we're seeing um, in some of the states now where, you know, the, even the conversation about diversity is one that is 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 suspicious. Um, so the uh, you know, higher education in the United States has always been, well, I shouldn't say it, the 20th and 21st century has been a place where people from throughout the world go to create new knowledge. And we sort of take that for granted, but I don't know that we should take that for granted going forward if, you know, if there aren't some of these changes that I've talked about. <clears throat> um, sir. Along the same line of your question, <clears throat> the major universities that accept students from around the world, India, China, and all over the world, come in on student visas. Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook he opened an office in Canada because they're on student visas. They have to go back to their country. He's been grabbing up the smartest of the group 
and hiring him in Canada for his company. So a lot of lot of big major corporations that's their work around. Well, folks, um, I think we're I always like to share my email, and I forgot to put it in my slide deck today. But I'm the only Decipio at UCI. You can find me if you have any questions. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Melora. One more thing. Money, 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 money. With a chicken dinner. Thank you for giving us the extra time. Because we had the extra time, our winner is going to get $45 more than you are paying. Yes. So thank you for that, everybody. Okay. Here we go. Ticket, no, I'm in. The amount, what's the amount? It's 117. 117, I think. I just had it in the text. 117 is the amount. So, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to get that excited over my mixing. There's one under the card. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Don't worry about it. Well, let's see. 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 Let's